Hello, I'm Barbara Callum. I teach ancient Roman art and architecture at Smith College in the States. I'd like to thank Anthony Smart for organizing this brilliant series, which I've been enjoying and of which I'm happy to be a part. So let me begin. In the immortal words of Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Although the sweetening agent would have been different, cane sugar was a product to be exploited only by later empires, the principle was nonetheless one, I will argue, was well known to the designers who transformed Augustan Rome into a world capital. This is not necessarily apparent if one looks only at the one or two structures which have often come to characterize the city as a whole. The Forum of Augustus, for example, projects the triumphalist rhetoric of earlier victory monuments on a colossal scale with a statue of Augustus, father of the fatherland in a four horse chariot before the temple of Mars, the Avenger and encircled by portrait statues and inscriptions of great men of history arranged around the Trojan Aeneas, son of Venus, an ancestor of Julius Caesar and his grand nephew and heir Augustus in one hemicycle and Rome's founder Romulus in the other. The program to be relished by the emperor's supporters perhaps, but not necessarily by all those who were compelled to interact with it. Since thanks to the wax tablets from Herculaneum Puteoli, we know that participants in lawsuits were directed to magistrates tribunals in the hemicycles of the Forum of Augustus, according to which statue they were near. Though more human in scale and perhaps more user-friendly, the Arapacus or the altar to Augustan peace utilizes much the same vocabulary. Actively comparing Augustus making sacrifice with Aeneas from the legendary past. And while celebrating bountiful plenty in both its burgeoning Acanthus wainscoting and on the east side in a relief of the fruitful earth or talus, these elements are nonetheless held in balance here with a vigilant warrior Roma seated on her pile of captured armaments. This east side of the monument was likely the one most frequently seen as it faced the Violata thoroughfare. Those who circumnavigated the Arapax, however, surely would have noticed a feature not seen in historical relief heretofore, portrait images of women and children. On the south side of the altar enclosure, just behind the emperor himself and his son-in-law Agrippa was the Empress Livia. And behind her with their families, Antonia the Younger and Antonia the Elder, the daughters of Augustus' beloved sister Octavia, who married her brother's rival, Mark Antony in 40 BC to make peace between them. Until of course, Antony left Octavia for Cleopatra. By 35 BC, the Senate had granted both Libya and Octavia the right to public statues to manage their own affairs and the sacrosanctity of tributes. In their early images, the sisters-in-law wore the same simple and elegant notice hairstyle with its characteristic roll of hair atop the forehead, a style that was quickly emulated by women across the empire. Livia and Octavia also became the first women in the history of the city of Rome to dedicate buildings in their own names. Both built public porticos, places where people from all walks of life could stroll, converse, and enjoy some of the pleasures usually associated with the villas of the rich and famous. This people's palace aspect must have been especially apparent at the porticos of Livia, as it was built on the site of the raised mansion of the vainglorious freedman son, Vedius Polio. One of the most far-flung of Augustan building projects, the Porticus of Livia would nonetheless have been visible from the Forum because of its sheer size, a little larger than a modern soccer field, and because it stood on the Esquiline Hill. Rising above the teeming Subura with its tenements, houses, and shops, the Porticus stood at the intersection of several major roads. We know its plan thanks to that giant third century CE jigsaw puzzle known as the former urbis or marble plan. And here's the Porticus of Livia fragment, as you can see. At the center of the complex was a shrine to marital concord, very like the Arapacus in plan. Ovid, in his Ars Amatoria, tells us that the Porticus of Livia was decorated with old master paintings. 
and was a good place to pick up girls. We do not know the name of any of the paintings which hung there, but thanks to Pliny the Elder, we know a great deal about the natural wonder for which the porticus was renowned. A giant grapevine, which grew from a single stem, shaded the entire porticus, and which produced 12 amphorae of musk for wine each year. We have not a clue how the wine was distributed, but for Livia, who toward the end of her life attributed her 86 years to drinking a particular wine from the Veneto each day, I imagine it may well have been on a first come first serve basis, perhaps from the shops which flanked the entry to her porticus. Certainly a grapevine is the most compelling natural metaphor for rebirth imaginable. For each spring, a new leaf springs forth from what seems to be dead wood, and by late summer, the grapes are ready for harvest. Indeed, the porticus of Livia marked the pivotal transition from the urban squalor of the Sabura to the greening of the Escaline, where gardens, like that of Augustus culture minister Mycenas, transformed the outskirts of the hill from a burial ground for the destitute to rich agricultural states. Livia's other gift to the Escaline a few blocks from her porticos and bookending that green belt was a Macallum or fresh food market at the Porta Esquilina. This capitalized on both the products of the proximate estates, but also on the fruit, vegetables, meat, wine, and flowers of the Tiber countryside beyond. Livia herself seems to have been something of a horticulturalist, as a type of fig she introduced was named for her. And moreover, she was the owner of vast agricultural estates in Egypt, in Italy, and throughout the Roman world. In a time when famine remained a real threat, Livia's association with the providing of actual foodstuffs, not just the representation of them, likely was a factor in her being identified with the goddess of agricultural fertility, Ceres, as inscriptions and statues indicate she was even during her lifetime. There was no bellicose posturing in Livia's gifts to the Escaline. Indeed, I think they were one of the sweetening agents which made the medicine go down easily, especially if it was accompanied by an annual sip of free wine. Nonetheless, as members of the ruling class surely noted, while the Porticus of Livia with its shrine to marital concord affirmed the empress as a dutiful wife, it simultaneously with its giant grapevine and the nearby Macellan asserted that Livia had on a vast scale co-opted the role of land-owning agronomist extraordinaire, which had always been the core identity of elite Roman men. As a daughter of Marcus Livius Drusus Claudianus, Livia was herself, after all, an aristocrat, which she deftly underscores in the one building of inscription of hers remaining to us, that from her refurbishment of the Temple of Womanly Fortune. Rather than adopting the conventional affiliation abbreviation for freeborn males, of the first letter of their father's prenum or first name, and the letter F, Livia instead makes use of her father's cognomen, his last name, indicating her aristocratic lineage. Moreover, her pedigree precedes the name of her husband, the princeps. In all her monuments, Livia provided an, uh, uh, proved adept at attraction, co-option, and persuasion, the tactics of soft power in contrast to the coercion and saber rattling of hard power. Just as Livia transformed a portion of the Esquiline into a greenscape, so her sister-in-law Octavia transformed what had once been a triumphal monument into a commemorative monument of a decidedly different sort. What had been the Porticus of Metellus, built around the temples of Jupiter Stator and Juna Regina in 147 BCE by Quintus Caecilius Metellus, to celebrate his victory over Macedonia, became the porticus of Octavia. A portion of the entry or propylaea to Octavia's porticus survives today in Rome. In this instance, thanks to Pliny the Elder, we know a great deal about what was on display, much of which subtly but steadfastly structured and broadcast Octavia's public persona. Her stalwart devotion to her brother, the princeps, was mirrored in several paintings featuring the, tra the Trojan princess, Hesione. First her rescue from the sea monster by Hercules, then after her perfidious father, King Laomedon, is killed in battle, she becomes the spoils prize of the Greek hero, Telamon. 
and is granted the favor of being able to spare one of the other prisoners. Visione chose her youngest brother, whose name thereafter is Priam, the ransomed one, at which point Hercules crowns the boy king. A megalographic fresco in Pompeii, which you see here, may or may not reflect the paintings in Octavius Porticus. As many scholars have discussed, the second century BCE bronze statue of Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, all we have left is the Augustine statue base, provided the perfect analog to Octavia. After her husband's death, Cornelia had dedicated herself to raising and educating her two sons and a daughter, her jewels, and rejected a marriage proposal from a Greco-Roman monarch, none other than the great-great-grandfather of the last of the Ptolemies, Cleopatra VII, to whom Octavius X, Antony, had succumbed. Octavia was certainly the supermother of her generation, raising not only her own children, her beloved son Marcellus and two daughters from her first marriage, as well as the two Antonias she had with Antony, but also surviving children of Antony by his other wives, Fulvia and Cleopatra as well. Like her brother, Octavia was, through her great uncle, Julius Caesar, a descendant of Venus, and celebrated this with four statues of the goddess in her porticus, one of which, a seated statue by the fifth century BCE sculptor Phidias, was to become a portrait statue type for later empresses, and may well have been the model for the statue of Cornelia as well. Like Octavia, Venus was also a mother and had a beloved son, Eros, the god of love himself, who was represented in two world-famous statues at the Porticus of Octavia. One of the two, an Eros by the fourth century BCE sculptor Praxiteles, is a particularly pivotal one, since it is one of the rare instances in which we can trace how the statue got to the Porticus. It was taken from the household chapel by the rapacious um, uh, Varys when he was governor of Sicily, then possessed by Antony when he had Varys prescribed in 43 BCE and took his treasures, and finally passed to Octavia in Antony's estate. As many ancient epigrams attested, it was considered a particularly poignant eros, as it was filled with all the sculptor's sadness over his, un, his own unrequited love. That Octavia added this statue to her porticus may bespeak her final and most enduring role, that of a mother in perpetual mourning. During the time the porticus was being built in the 20s BCE, Octavia's beloved son, Marcellus, the only potential male heir in Augustus' own bloodline, was being groomed as heir apparent. In 25 BCE, at the age of 17, Marcellus was married to Augustus' only biological child, his 14-year-old daughter, Julia, and the next year, Marcellus served as Adon and put on magnificent games. But then fate intervened and he fell ill and died at the tender age of 19. Marcellus was first to be buried in the mausoleum of Augustus, where his mother's ashes would eventually be deposited next to his. And Augustus had statues of him erected everywhere. In its final form, the porticus of Octavia became a shrine to the deceased Marcellus and his mother, housing a Greek and a Latin library named for him and a curio or assembly place named for her. This memorial function inflected every aspect of what had been heretofore Martellus Macedonicus's triumphal monument, including, I believe, its most famous statuary grouping, 26 life-size bronze statues by Lysippus of Alexander the Great and his 25 young lieutenants, all of whom, save Alexander, died in helping him to win his first great victory over the Persians at the River Granicus in 334 BCE. Although all traces of the statuary group have disappeared, a bronze statuette in Naples preserves the Alexander type, and what may be a marble copy of the group was excavated at the sanctuary of Juno Sospita in Lanuvium in the 1880s. Like his Republican counterparts, Augustus was routinely identified with Alexander, but I contend that the 25 heroic young lieutenants were equally important here, as they found, furnished counterparts in multiple for the tragic youth Marcellus. Marcellus had died of illness and not in battle, but his role as his uncle, the emperor's lieutenant, had been a very public one. In 29 BCE, Marcellus rode the right trace horse 
accompanying the chariot of the young Caesar in his victory after the Battle of Actium. And prior to his marriage to Julia, Marcellus had served with Augustus in Spain. An additional memento of Alexander in the Porticus of Octavia emphasized the youth and perhaps ultimately the vulnerability of Alexander himself, who after all also died young, as it was a painting of him with his father, Philip II and the goddess Minerva, a stand in here from Oliver Stone's 2004 biopic of the hero. Alexander was barely 20 when his father was assassinated. So the painted image of him may well have served as yet another reminder of Marcellus dead at the tender age of 19. Although programs of decoration have all too often only been analyzed building by building, it is the case that every building surrounding the porticos of Octavia was either built or completely renovated in the Augustan era. So the entire area resonated with the tragic loss of Marcellus. Augustus named the theater directly across from the um, porticos for Marcellus and a golden statue of the youth was to be carried into the theater and seated among the officials at the Ludi Romani. Indeed, historical and mythological parallels for mournful mothers and promising youths who died young abound in this area. For purposes of time, I'll mention only one, the temple of Apollo Sosianus next door to the Porticus of Octavia. It housed indeed perhaps the most renowned group of those who died suddenly and way too young, the dying children of Niobe, whom you see here in reproductions um, in the gardens of the Villa Medici or here on a later sarcophagus. The Niobids died in a hail of arrows brought down by their mother's prideful boast that her seven sons and seven daughters outshone Latona's two, Apollo and Diana. Niobe, indicated here by the red arrow, was turned to stone to mourn perpetually with tears still trickling down the marble as Ovid describes her in the Metamorphoses. Bad mother Niobe and good Octavia united in their grief for those who died too young. Literary sources tell us that Octavia was so devastated by the loss of her son that she withdrew entirely, living in seclusion after her death in 11 BCE. But her porticus and the works of art in it as well as those in the surrounding area, established her public persona and kept both Octavia and Marcellus before the eyes of the public. Just as with Livia's celebration of agricultural abundance on the Esquiline, so too here I think the transformation of a triumphal monument into an oasis for learning and remembrance had the potential to touch the hearts as well as the minds of everyday Romans. Sadly, Octavia's loss was not unique. Infant and child mortality rates were high. And so too, as the family funerary monuments which proliferated in the Augustan period attest, was the death of young men and young women just as they began to realize the potential in life. So for example, on the funerary relief of the lookalike Gessii, as the side inscription specifies, it is the wife who is the sole survivor and she erects their funerary monument in accordance with the testament of her deceased son. Those with sharp eyes will know that for her image for all eternity, Gessia claims as her own the notice hairstyle popularized by Octavia and Livia. Although images of Octavia and Livia were not televised worldwide, I believe contemporary media theory may have a, offer us a useful lens on the close identification between viewer and simulacrum, note the mass, which I think pertained in the Augustan era as well. Indeed, as I see it, what Octavia and Augustus constructed in the area of the theater of Marcellus was a veritable family broadcast center where the personal loss of son and nephew merged with mythological and historical comparanda and the combinations were experienced daily by all who passed through this mesmerizing area of the city. When Germanicus, Tiberius heir apparent died suddenly in 19 CE. It was here between the porticus of Octavia and the theater of Marcellus that a commemorative arch with statues of him and his extended family was erected. So too, after the death of the first emperor in 14 CE, it was here a colossal seated statue of Augustus and statues of the Domus Augusta 
a new phrase for what was now officially the living members of a dynasty were erected. The dedication of that seated statue of Divus Augustus by Livia, she is now named Julia Augusta, as Augustus' widow, chief priestess, and posthumously adopted daughter, and her son, now the emperor Tiberius, is shown here on the Fasti Prenestini, the calendar engraved on marble, erected by various Flaccus, the freedman, grammarian, antiquarian, and tutor to Augustus' grandson, Gaius and Lucius, as a part of a public monument in his hometown, Praeneste. Just as this imperial dedication of the statue of Divus Augustus is seamlessly intertwined here with all the traditional festival days and ancient historical events of the month of April, so too did the Porticus of Livia and the Porticus of Octavia make the stories of the imperial family perpetually present and intricately a part of the lives of everyday Romans. With this image of the calendar on the screen, let me frame my conclusion by noting that today, the 23rd of September, just happens to be the birthday of Augustus. So a celebratory gesture seems in order. Of course, it might deflate his balloon just a bit to know that in 2021, it is not he himself, but Livia, who is getting the Game of Thrones treatment in the new epic series, Domina. A pity, however, that it is still the scheming power behind the throne, Livia, from Tacitus by way of Robert Graves, I. Claudius, which seems to be the source of inspiration here. About time we considered the possibility that the images of both Octavia and Livia, which appear in Tacitus and other Roman authors, seem to correlate precisely to a negative take on their personas established by their buildings. Octavia as a grieving malingerer and Livia as a power mad poisoner who is rumen, rumored to have done in the aged Augustus with a plate of poison figs. Ultimately, this may have far more to do with the extreme anxiety generated by these two women who had successfully co-opted a privilege which had always in the Roman patriarchy been exclusively that of elite men, the agency to construct and dedicate public buildings so that they too could declare I build, therefore I am. Their porticos were, of course, as ideologically charged as any of their bombastically triumphalist Augustan counterparts. But speaking in a language of fruitful grapevines, devoted mothers and beloved sons, they created spaces of peace, pleasure, and repose, which likely made both the notion of an imperial family and of imperialism more, pal more palatable to Romans from many walks of life across generations. These were the sweeteners which helped the medicine go down. A deft use of the soft power of persuasion, or to put it another way, as another age old adage holds, you can catch more flies with honey. Thank you. Happy to discuss or answer questions. There's my email address.